Welcome to part one of the next module, which provides an overview of pattern relationships. In this module, we're going to motivate the need for pattern relationships that go above and beyond traditional pattern collections. We're also going to outline some of the common types of pattern relationships, including pattern complements, pattern compounds, pattern sequences, and pattern languages. If you take a look at a lot of the early work on patterns, you'll find that many of the patterns are presented in a standalone manner. And this is fine to provide people with the basic infrastructure and foundation for patterns, but in some sense, isolated patterns are limited because they provide point solutions to relatively bounded problems that arise within specific contexts. For example, the proxy pattern described in the Gang of Four and Post of One book provides a way to shield clients from the location where the objects actually reside. That's fairly narrow. Likewise, the singleton pattern makes it possible to provide global access to one instance of an object without requiring the use of global variables. Also a fairly narrowly defined context. It's also worth pointing out, by the way, that there's a whole body of literature talking about the various drawbacks and issues with Singleton. And I encourage you to take a look at this link to find out more about some of the issues associated with using that particular pattern. A most common way of being able to present standalone patterns is in the form of what's known as a pattern collection. There are lots of great examples of pattern collections that you can easily find and learn from. The Gang of Four book, the Post of One book, the various books in the Pattern Languages of Program Design series. These all provide patterns that document individual patterns, focusing in on the motivations for them, what their structure and dynamics are, the consequences of applying them, many examples in Java, C++, Smalltalk, and C, and so on. This is very useful as a building block. In practice, however, standalone patterns are rare. It's unusual to find a design where you'll find a single pattern, like the observer pattern, working by itself. Whenever you find a more sophisticated software design, you'll invariably find many patterns working together. For example, let's say that we wanted to develop some kind of broker architecture to allow us to be able to isolate the communication concerns in the infrastructure from the business logic concerns of the application. We could apply the broker pattern, which makes it possible to decouple the applications from the underlying communication infrastructure. What we would discover, of course, is that broker is comprised of many other patterns. Some of these patterns are patterns you would see as a user of a broker. Other patterns you would see as a developer of a broker. But the point is that the broker architecture is actually a whole pile of patterns that work together. The key challenge we have as developers and users of patterns is how to organize these patterns in a way that will be most effective for the users of the patterns that we document. So let's start talking about pattern relationships. Before we do so, however, it's important to make sure we underscore that pattern collections have been used very successfully in practice. So we're not in any way, shape, or form criticizing pattern collections. For example, if you take a look at the POSO 1 or Gang of Four book, you'll see many examples of pattern collections being applied to do interesting things. Uh, if you look at Chapter 2 in the Gang of Four book, you'll see an example application of a document editor called Lexi. And the chapter walks through a series of design problems that arise when trying to build a document editor, editor and talk about how various Gang of Four patterns can be applied to resolve those design problems effectively. And this is great. And many other systems have been developed in similar ways. However, if you look carefully at the description, they're describing those patterns individually, one at a time, resolving a particular design problem. What you find in practice, however, is that patterns tend to be very social. They like to work together. 
So when you look at sophisticated, significant, substantial designs, you'll see that these patterns often interact and collaborate. They're gregarious. They like to chat. So, for example, if you take a look at our broker example, you'll see that it always comes along with other patterns, patterns like proxy or adapter or reactor. And that's what makes it interesting, is the combination of those patterns and the way in which they're woven together to capture larger parts of the design space. It turns out that patterns commonly have several different types of relationships. Let me outline them briefly here, and then in the rest of the parts of this module, we'll go into more detail and provide more examples. One type of pattern relationship, one of the most basic types, is called a pattern complement. And there's several different variations of a pattern complement. In one variation, one pattern provides a missing ingredient needed by another pattern. For example, we'll see later that the factory method pattern can be used to create objects in a design. And we need to have a pattern complement often called a disposal method to free up the resources that are created by the factory method. Pattern complements also provide a way to be able to contrast one pattern with another to provide an alternative solution to a related design problem. For example, you may be familiar with the iterator pattern, which makes it possible to access each element in a particular aggregate or container one at a time. This works fine if you're in a single-threaded environment. When you start working in a multi-threaded environment or a distributed environment, in an environment where latency becomes an issue, it turns out that we may want to go and use a complementary pattern, a competing pattern, one that's called batch method, where we group together a sequence of operations in order to be able to avoid the round-trip latency of going across these expensive domain crossings. Another form of pattern relationship is called a pattern compound. Pattern compounds capture recurring sub-communities of patterns that can be treated as a single decision in response to a recurring design problem. Going back to our example of, of the uh, batch method, it turns out that batch method can actually be perceived and described as a pattern compound, combining the composite pattern with the command pattern, both of which are a gang of four patterns. So we can either look at batch method as a pattern complement to iterator, or we can look at it as a pattern compound that's built out of more basic gang of four patterns. Another form of pattern relationship is called a pattern sequence. Pattern sequences join predecessor patterns with successor patterns to form part of their context. In other words, the predecessor patterns form part of the context of the successor patterns. And we can use this in order to be able to solve more sophisticated, longer chains of design problems. Uh, for example, it turns out when you try to build flexible frameworks or flexible middleware that has to be used in different contexts in different ways, it's often useful, as we'll see shortly, to apply a pattern sequence consisting of the gang of four strategy pattern to be able to provide pluggable implementations of different mechanisms for the framework or middleware, together with the abstract factory pattern from the Gang of Four book, which allows us to be able to create groups of semantically compatible strategies. And we can also apply the component configurator pattern from the POSA 2 book to be able to dynamically configure the factories and strategies so you don't have to pay the costs for components you don't actually use in a particular use case or a particular application context. The fourth and final type of pattern relationship that we'll cover is the most powerful and sophisticated, called pattern languages. Pattern languages are networks of related patterns that define a process for the orderly resolution of software development problems that occur in particular domain or domains. Of course, we'll be focusing primarily on the software domain. But it's important to realize that if you take a look around at the literature, for example, if you take a look at the Wikipedia link on pattern languages, you'll learn that they were actually first formulated in the different domain altogether, the domain of building architectures, where they were used to describe how to design more livable buildings, livable cities, and so on. 
We'll be focusing on the software aspects, but it's important to realize that pattern languages transcend software. What pattern languages will allow us to do is to be able to explore alternative portions of a design space, to be able to capture trade-offs and different ways of trying to solve problems that have different forces and different constraints. Uh, for example, we'll be talking about how we can apply different patterns al alternatively to handle concurrency in our running example. So we may use a reactor, or we may use a half-sync, half-async pattern, or we may use a pattern called leader followers. All of these are POSA2 patterns, and they give us different ways to navigate through the concurrent aspects of a software design in order to be able to provide greater scalability in some cases, greater simplicity in others, greater predictability, and yet different contexts. So we'll be exploring these different dimensions in the rest of this module. So to summarize this part, much of the existing literature on patterns organizes them in the form of pattern catalogs, which provides a great foundation. That's how I learned patterns when I was first exposed to them. But we need more. We need to go further. And of course, that's because substantial software designs are composed of many patterns. And it's our job as architects, designers, programmers, educators, to figure out how to effectively organize these patterns to make them easier to learn and easier to apply. Throughout the rest of the part in this module, you'll get a chance to look at different ways to apply different types of pattern relationships.